So, um, as I was saying in the previous video, phylogeny can be related to plate tectonics and how the continents have drifted. So, um, that's talking about the idea of Pangaea. Um, so remember, Pangaea, as adorable as this cartoon is, is when the continents were cuddling. They were all one thing, right? Um, and then they started breaking up. Um, what people don't realize is that the um, Pangaea actually came together and then it broke apart. So we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. So it wasn't always just together and then um, came apart. It was apart, came together, and then really came apart. Um, so here's some, <laughs> some hilarious nerd cartoons, but you know, you got to have those because then it's more fun. Um, okay, so that's a little bit more realistic, uh, that picture there. So let's talk about Pangaea forming. So that's it coming together. So a couple of changes happen with that. First of all, you have species that were isolated from one another, all of a sudden smushed up next to each other, and now they're going to start competing. Um, another thing that happened is the total amount of shoreline reduced. Instead of having a bunch of islands, now they're coming together and forming one big island, so you decrease the amount of coastline. Um, ocean basins increased in depth, so sea level actually went down. And ocean currents changed, because a lot of ocean currents are going to be bouncing off of these land masses, so that's going to change stuff. Now, Pangaea breaks apart. When Pangaea broke apart, now we've got geographic isolation again. So we've got divergence of species and that type of stuff. And that helps to explain how things are distributed today, like we talked about with biogeography. <clears throat> okay, so when we look at um, branching diagrams, which are called phylogenetic trees or cladograms, um, it's going to be broken into what are called clades. And if we go to this, I can show you what I am speaking about. Now, when you look at this slide, don't worry about the shaded boxes yet. What I want you to notice is like B and C are in a clade together, right? Um, you could say A, B, and C are in a clade together. D and E are in a clade together, right? So every time it kind of branches off, that's going to be a clade. <clears throat> now, Let's talk about these words down here, monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic. The first thing I want you to notice about these drawings is that if you take away the shading boxes, the background, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the gray are all the same. So hopefully you can see that. Um, what we're using this for is, let's say that we only wanted to be discussing groups A, B, and C, okay? If we are talking about groups A, B, and C, we would call that a monophyletic group because we are talking about um, an ancestor and all of its descendants, right? So we've got this common ancestor here and all of its descendants are included in this group of organisms that we've decided to talk about. Now, if we look over here, um, D, E, and F, that's going to be called a paraphyletic group. And the reason is because we're talking about an ancestor and some, but not all, of its descendants, right? So we've left out G when we're talking about this group, so we call that a paraphyletic group. Then the last type is going to be called a polyphyletic group, and that's going to be where you have an ancestor and all of its descendants, plus an extra one that's kind of an outlier. And so if we were talking about C, D, E, F, and G, that would be called polyphyletic because of the C that we've included in there. So that's just ways that you can talk about groups of organisms and how that works. Now, how do you make these trees? This is an interesting process. So um, what you can do to do that is you can line up a bunch of characters, which are going to be big traits that are pretty important, um, and then you can line up your organisms that you're looking at. And what you do is you put a zero if they don't have those um, characteristics, and you put a one if they do. And so what you do is every time you have a new characteristic, you can, um, you can call that one that doesn't have any of them um, an outgroup, right? So in this situation, the lancelet is going to be our outgroup because it has zeros all the way down. It doesn't have any of those characteristics, right? Um, so that's going to be our first outgroup. Then the next thing is hinged jaws. Well, you can see everybody here has hinged jaws except for the lamprey, so that would be our next outgroup. And that's kind of how you make a phylogenetic tree. Am I ever going to have you do this on an exam? Probably not, but I just wanted you to see the process and, and how outgroups work. So the outgroups are just the ones that are a little distinct because they don't have a certain characteristic. Um, okay, so remember when you do the cladograms to keep homologous versus analogous um, characteristics apart, 
Then um, you identify your characteristics, which we were showing you in that table. And then you can pick out your outgroups and your in-groups. So obviously the out-group is the one that doesn't have that characteristic. The in-group is everybody else. And that's how you keep making your steps on your cladogram. I hope you enjoyed that. And that's it for the evolution stuff.